I'm a college attention okay. specialist at the, the Red Hook Initiative. It is my pleasure to be here today. First off, I want to do a huge shout out to all of our volunteers today, all of our youth leaders, all of our RSI staff who are out here on a Saturday. Yes. Shout out to Obi, the main man with the plan. And all of our youth leaders as well who will be asking all of our candidates the question because they are community, they are part of this community. They are invested. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our executive director of RHI, Lori Monaco, for a few words. I'm Morgan. I'm so happy to see all of your beautiful faces here today. Here at the Red Hook Initiative, we believe that the social change needed to improve our world begins with youth. And so I want to thank all of the young people and the young adults who helped put on this afternoon's event. We also believe that it's important to be involved in your community, and that includes voting. And this year is a very special election. We have a new way of voting, and we want to make sure everybody knows that they can register to vote, that they can uh, need to learn about how to do ranked choice voting, and that we have a number of candidates who are want to join us in our effort to help make Red Hook the most beautiful community it can be. So I want to thank you all for coming out, for doing what you can to tell people how to vote, uh, because your vote and your voice really do matter, and you have an impact. So I want to thank you all. And without further ado, I want to turn it over to the young people. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. So, as I mentioned before, our youth leaders will be the ones asking the questions. Everyone should have received the topic. So, without further ado, I will I would like to introduce Aaliyah to come up. She will ask you guys some questions around your plan for Red Hook. But before we get there, we're just going to ask you to introduce yourself, um, your name, um, and just a little bit about yourself. I know you all are politicians, so you have to be very long-winded. We're going to try to keep this to two or three minutes for each response. So we're here for until 4 o'clock, and we don't want to get in trouble by the police. So thank you very much. So. I'll we'll start off here, and then we will have Aaliyah start off with the first line of questions. Good afternoon, and thank you for having us here today. Um, great to see all the young adults here. My name is Victor Swinton. Um, I'm a, I live out of Sunset Park. I've been living there for the past 51 years. Did a lot of running around in Red Hook with the softball, the baseball, um, and I'm a funny for any kind of affiliation. Thank you. Hello, Red Hook. How are you? Good to see you. My name is Cesar Suriga, and I'm running to represent District 38 in the City Council. I'm a dad. Uh, I'm a proud son of Mexican immigrants. Uh, I also have done education for the entirety of my professional career. And I'm thrilled to be here, and I'm looking forward to this conversation. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, Red Hook! I'm from Red Hook, I grew up here, and I'm running to represent our home, our amazing, beautiful, strong home. I'm a yeah, lifelong activist and community organizer, and um, you know, I want to give us, give our community a voice in City Hall. So. My name is Yuen. Um, I'm running to represent this district, this beautiful district. Um, so I'm 29 years old. Technically, I'm still in my 20s. I'm a dad of two beautiful babies. Uh, I'm a husband. I'm a proud son of immigrant also. Um, I'm running because as a resident here, I feel like our voice matters. And it's important to get our young people involved in the government sector. Um, there are a lot of long-term problems that need to be solved. And there's if they need a lot of time, long-term planning to solve. One of them, you know, will be with retirement issues. Um, as the pension funds are drying out, what's going to happen when we turn to 60? Are we going to have money for our retirement? You know, these are the problems that only we can solve for ourselves, 
and also for the generation be before us, for the generation behind us. Um, it's time that we've had to do something for our society, for the environment, and for everything, all the problems that we see today. Um, we can just lay down and, and blame about it, or we can stand up to do something about it. And I choose the latter. We want to make a difference, to make a change, to make an impact and a different impression on New York City. Thank you. Hey Red Hook, how are you doing today? Alright, so my name is Alexa Vives. I am a Boricua mom of two beautiful daughters who are 12 and 15, public school students. We are, I am an organizer in education, I am an advocate, I've worked on many policy issues in the community for a long, long time. And so I'm honored here to be running to represent this beautiful district and I look forward to the conversation and thank you to our host and our young people. Hey, what's up, Red Hook? ¿Cómo estamos? Buenas tardes. My name is Rodrigo Camarena. I'm a lifelong immigrant advocate. I'm a dad and I'm an organizer running to represent this beautiful community. A little bit about me. Like many of my neighbors, I'm a proud immigrant. My parents came from Mexico. I became a U.S. citizen 10 years ago. I'm a community organizer. I fought alongside many of you to stop the rezoning of Industry City and fight for tenants around Brooklyn. And I'm also a small business advocate. I was down here after Superstorm Sandy hit, helping small businesses recover, and that's a little bit about me. But I'm running because for too long, we've been told we couldn't have development without displacement. We've been told we couldn't have security without policing. And we've been told we couldn't have prosperity without inequality. I think those are false choices, and I'm running to prove people wrong. Thank you. Hi everybody, my name is Olivia Sanchez and I'm a public safety organizer at Art HI. My first question is, what do you think makes Red Hook unique? Thank you for that question. I think Red Hook is unique due to the diversity that's in this community. Um, while I'm walking around here, I see the different di the diversity, people engaging with each other, how people are down by the waterfront, waterfront eating and enjoying each other. Um, so just to see that camaraderie with the people is, is important to me. I like to see how neighbors are embracing neighbors. and. And in saying that, we need to ensure that we take care of our young folks. I always, I always say, um, our young folks are our future. One of the candidates already said up here, you know, we gotta look out for the kids when they get older. You guys, this is great because I'm glad that you are getting involved with these forums. Because I'm, I'm hoping that one day this is you up here. So, I, I, I like the, the, again, the diversity, the, the community, togetherness, and um, the young folks that are within it. Thank you. So thank you for that. So thank you for. <laughs> so thank you for that question. Um, so I, I think what makes Red Hook unique, obviously, is the people in Red Hook, um, but the fact that you're a waterfront community. And, and I see the waterfront as possibly the, the most important asset, physical asset that this community has. I see it as um, opportunity. I see the waterfront as opportunity to generate jobs, to generate economic development. That's not just gonna benefit the district, but it's gonna benefit the region. So I think we need to have leadership in the city council that can have some serious conversations about the future of this waterfront and how we want to develop it in a way that's smart and sustainable. And so the waterfront to me is a very unique and special asset in this community. Thank you for the question. So thank you for this question. What makes Red Hook unique? First of all, everything. Second of all, 
the people do. And what I really need about that is Red Hook is a place that's always taking care of itself and of each other. And that's something that we've had for decades. Because Red Hook faces a lot of adversity, a lot of disinvestment, but we are a thriving, strong community. And Red Hook taught me how to be an organizer, and this is what I'm doing now. And I am a product of Red Hook. And I, you know, I heard someone say that you, the youth could be up here soon. No, the youth are going to be up here soon. And <laughs> yeah, they are the ones hosting this forum. Yeah! And that is what makes Red Hook unique. We are a community with so many things stacked against us, yet we thrive and succeed every single day. We take care of each other, we take care of ourselves. Red Hook has taught me that. And now, this is why I'm doing this, to take care of us. Thank you. Thank you for this question. So I think Red Hook is a very unique place. But it, it has so much potential that we can do about it. And for years it's been neglected. It's been, it's been underfunded. Uh, just look at this playground. It's been underfunded. I mean, clearly we can do much better. So if I were to be elected, I'm a sincere believer of community-led responsible development. I will create more jobs, more playground for children, more cultural center for our teenagers, uh, more museums, even develop the maritime areas, the waterfront. Um, it's a great investment opportunity. It's a great development opportunity we can bring to Red Hood to make this, this neighborhood one of the best neighborhoods in the city. And I think it's such a shame that we're sitting on top of gold mine and not taking it. People here are great. I see the, I see you know, the variety of people here, of uh, different color, different background, and we all live in harmony. We can show the city that we can do so much with the Red Hood and from the Red Hood. There's so much we can offer to the city. Thank you. So I think what makes Red Hook unique is its history of working class people coming from all kinds of communities to come here and build something for their families. Red Hook is resilient and vibrant, even through adversity. And that grit, that flavor, is unique to Red Hook because of its location and because of your collective history together. Hi, I'm sorry, what, what's your name? Aliyah. Oh yeah, that was a great question. Uh, you know, I think what makes Red Hook unique is you. It's, it's people like you organizing, stepping up, not only at this forum, but throughout this last year before then. You know, if it wasn't for this community stepping up after Superstorm Sandy, a lot of the development and building that is now happening in a really wrong way wouldn't have happened at all. If it wasn't for this community stepping up and fighting against the rezoning of our schools, we wouldn't have a new middle school coming to Red Hook. And if it wasn't for you stepping up and fighting for Black Lives last summer, we, when this community organized and fought for, for what we all believe in, we wouldn't see the kind of action that we see now happening at City Hall and that we should be happening at the City Council. So this community is strong and it's powerful and it's vibrant because of young people like you, because of Red Hook is a strong, resilient community that doesn't take a back seat to anything, okay? So thank you. Good question, thank you. Uh, um, one way we can get the community to show up at community board meetings is put some more community members on that board. And what I'm hearing, there's really not that many committee members sitting on that board. So we need to have more community members sitting on the board, get some information out to people, because that's another thing I'm hearing, they're not getting the information and as the city councilman here, I will ensure that that board is filled, or at least my portion will be filled with community members from Red Hook, as well as um, those individuals who are not engaged get the information to show up to them for meetings. Because as this election, 
Their vote counts in making decisions in this community. And they have to show up and just don't sit back and allow people to make decisions for them. So I will ensure that they have their fair share on the community board and I will get them the information to start going to New York and vote for things like that. So thank you for this question. This actually is uh, something that I feel very strongly about. So I'm the chair of Community Board 7, which is the uh, part of the district that represents Sunset Park and Windsor Terrace. And I have, since I took over as chair, my number one priority has been to engage more people in the process. When I came in, I was acutely aware of what I call the usual suspects. Same old gang of folks who show up, nothing against that. What I wanted to see though, and what I committed to, and I had some help here with, with, with one of my colleagues, is to make sure that we increase the, the, uh, the attendance of folks who don't historically participate. And how did we do that? Uh, we, we made sure that we communicated that transparency and accountability was number one. We, we had some really important conversations about the industry city rezoning. And we created a situation where we included people by eliminating barriers. So for that part of the district, language is a barrier. So a lot of the uh, public meetings that we had were translated into simultaneous translation into Spanish and Chinese. Because if you're gonna ask a community of immigrants to come to a meeting, they need to A, understand what's being said, and B, they need to, their voice is heard. Right, so we did things like that. We did childcare, we, did, we fed people. Is this messy, is this logistically complicated, is it expensive? Yes, absolutely. But if we're serious about community engagement, these are the things that we're gonna do. And these are the things that I'm committed to do at the city council across all kinds of spaces, not just community boards. That's number one. So that's the short-term solution. We have a long-term solution as well. We need to do something about the houses I've talked to so many of the neighbors in these houses. They've given up, and I don't blame them. But I want to encourage them to come back and to be engaged. But they have given up because the government, the local government, the state government, the federal government has done absolutely the worst possible job in maintaining these buildings. And so if you want to incentivize a community to engage, you have to respond to their needs. And that's the commitment that I'm making when I get to the city council. Enough of the petty politics where we're not going to talk to the assembly member because of this reason. We're not going to talk to the, con the congresswoman for that reason. We're going to work together and bring some results back to the houses. And that's going to increase the engagement of this community. Thank you. Thank you again for the question. Another great question. Now this question really means a lot to me from Red Hook because our community board is Community Board 6. Now, if you're familiar with Community Board 6, most everyone on that community board lives in Columbia Waterfront and Carroll Gardens, period. And they don't make it transparent or there's no accountability on them to have Red Hook representation on the community board. It doesn't make any sense. And it, to be honest, it's a little classic. Because the Red Hook Houses are the biggest NYCHA development in Brooklyn, okay? We need multiple seats on that community board. There is no if, and, or but. And this is something that I have fought for for the past several years with coalitions around Red Hook, you know, just last year. I was in the fight with several of my neighbors who work or work with RHI who when the community board decided as a topic they wanted to talk about the water outages and the gas outages, they didn't invite anyone from the houses. So there is no, we do not move forward in a society and with a government that makes decisions for other people. We, that time is done. The people who those decisions affect need to a seat at the table, period. And as council member, I will make sure I'm ready. I'm ready. Community Board 6 to hold them accountable, to make their meetings transparent and accessible. Not everybody has Zoom, okay? We need to make sure that these meetings 
are accessible to everyone. Computer, phone, in person, anything. Thank you. Uh, when people will come to the community board meeting or any meetings that are important for the community in general, I will go out to them. I will bring the meeting to them, make sure they'll, their voice will be heard. And that's what I've been doing throughout my campaign. I go out, I speak to people, and I tell them, if you're spending your time listening to my speech, it, it's only fair that I will spend my time and with my ears listen to your concerns. Tell me what your needs. Tell me what your concerns. Tell me what you want the government to know. And I haven't heard from anybody saying that I don't want to tell the government. To be honest, a lot of people said politics is BS. Politicians are BS. And that's fine. You know, I'll accept it. If that's what you want to tell me, I'll take it. And after they complain for a little while, for a few minutes, eventually they will tell me what their real concerns are. For example, I went to a pizzeria uh, two days ago, and he told me that because because of COVID, the government is creating a lot of regulations, a lot of extra work that they need to do. And at the same time, the government is creating an environment that is hard for them to hire. It's hard for them to hire someone to flip the burger, um, to do the work with them so they can focus on their real work. So these are the concerns that the government needs to know. Whenever the government passes out a message, what is the validity behind that message? What is the logic? You can't just tell people what to do and create works for them and just expect them to do it. That's not right. That's so right. whenever you have a meeting, it's about transferring the message from the government to the people. Now, sometimes those, those languages are pretty complicated. Not everyone goes to a law school. That should be the function of the company board. Translating those languages into a language that we can understand. What does it mean to us? How does it impact our daily life? Great and point. when people don't show up, you go to them. Community board meetings shouldn't be limited to certain hours or certain days of the week, like, you know, 7 p.m. at uh, Wednesday, certain locations, shouldn't be like that. If people don't come, then it, it is our job. You know, like, elected officials have to go out. Why aren't you coming? Is it because the time is not right for you? Is it because the vehicles are not right? Is it because you can't go on to a meeting? Or just you're disappointed in general? Now, to be honest, I think most people are disappointed. A lot of people are disappointed in politics, and I don't blame them. So it's now the time that we should give both of us a chance. We should give our politicians a chance, and we should get, give our people a chance to speak out their concerns. So what I've been doing throughout my campaign is going out to speak to people. And that's what I will do, to bring people more involved into politics, to make sure people will be more interested in politics again, because politics is too important. It's not a game. That's what I'm running. And that's what I will do. Thank you. So everybody here knows that community board members are appointed, right? So it means that the current council member or the borough president or some other particular interest puts names in. That in and of itself is a problem. So the first thing we need to do is democratize community boards. And what that means is opening up for anybody to run. And I do agree that there needs to be representation. And on CB6, we know Red Hook has maybe two or three spots on a 50-person body. That is not right. So there needs to be structural change, right? There needs to be full representation and not just geographic representation, but do we have young people? Do we have seniors? Do we have different interests, right? Not just homeowners, do we have renters? So we need to make sure that these bodies are representative. And we also need to make sure that the meetings are accessible. So I agree with, with many of my colleagues here. We need to bring these meetings into the community. We need to make sure that they are translated. We need to make sure that we are talking in plain speech. Right? Not everybody has a technical degree, but we as a government need to make sure that we provide the resources so that people can engage meaningfully. Yes. Because community members know what they need, they see and experience the barriers, they need to be given a meaningful place at the table to make the decisions that they need for themselves. So those are some of the ways that I would make sure to address the situation of community boards. Thank you. Yeah.
Yeah. And like going last is a disadvantage because a lot of this I've already been said. But uh, no, I think you know what my colleague just said is right. We need to the community board needs to come to the community. Ultimately, it's a 50 member body, mostly older, mostly white, and this is not just in CB6. This is citywide. So we need to change the way the community board is structured. We can't be appointed by elected. Civil rights. We need to democratize that process so that anybody can run and be on the community board. The community board also needs to recognize that the times aren't conducive for everybody. You know, providing childcare, providing food, mixing up the schedules is a good is a good way of doing that. Bringing the community board meetings to different places. You know, it's really hard to cross over to, to Columbia Waterfront to CD6. So we need to make sure that that, that that body exists not just in one place, but is everywhere. And that also includes increasing the size of the community board, ensuring that multiple communities are represented, that multiple backgrounds are represented in each group. And then lastly, you know, the community board is a really, really big deal. Land use decisions happen there, licensing decisions happen there, decisions that impact everybody's life happen at the community board. And if we're not there advocating for our interests, if only a special, small group of people is advocating for their interests, what happens? We get developments we don't want, we get bars we don't want, we get decisions made for us. So we need to ensure that that process is changed and it's going to require a charter revision. You know, that's what it takes to change the community board. We need to change the New York City Charter. And that's what I want to do in the City Council. Thank you. All right, I told you guys that our students are ready. Our youth leaders are ready. In all equity, we're going to start at the other end and then come back this way. So, without further ado, one of our other youth leaders, the bill first. All right. Hi, my name is Ogalis. I'm the organizer at the Red Hook Initiative. I had two questions today, actually. Um, my first question being, how can you ensure that the voices of the Red Hook community are heard when it comes to decision making? Great question, Ogalis. Thank you so much. That's a really great question. Um, you know, I don't understand why a city council member can't open up a space in Red Hook to listen to residents and tenants. I mean, I think that's been the case for way too long. As city council member, I want to govern alongside our community. I want to create a council that's representative of our district, that's representative of every neighborhood, and that's representative of different interests, so that we co-govern together. Because it's not going to take any one of us to fix every problem. I'm going to tell you right now, none of us can do this alone. We need all of you to help us. We need all of us to come together to fix the challenges that we have. So that starts by creating a body and a structure for us to govern together. That's number one. Number two, we need, a, we need to have a physical space here for Red Hook. So I'm going to talk to our assemblywoman. I'm going to talk to our congresswoman. I'm going to talk to our senators to share a space. We don't need to have five offices each. <laughs> we can have offices that are strategically located so that we have spaces for you all to come in and talk to us about the issues. And then lastly, we need to make sure that we're accountable to you. And that's going to happen in two years, FYI. Because in two years, whoever wins this seat is going to be on the ballot again. Okay? So we're going to be accountable to you, and I'm going to make sure as council member that in two years, and four years, this community still thrives, irrespective of who's in that seat. That's a short answer, but thank you so much for stepping up and for being a leader in your community. So I think we engage the community and make sure community members are heard through a couple ways. I wholeheartedly agree with Rodrigo in that Red Hook hasn't seen their elected representatives have an office here. I don't know if ever they've had an office here. And I know there's been ongoing disappointment about that. And so I am committed to figuring out, I know there are barriers, right? And one of them is, among many, is the very little resources that actual New York City government provides to their council offices to truly do the best job they can for its constituencies. 
So we got to recognize that the government is also tying one hand behind our backs in the kind of services we can provide. But we're going to fight through that. So we, I am committed to making sure that we bring services here. And what I mean by that is that we have representation, not only from Red Hook on our staff, but also that we have presence in this community. And maybe it's a couple days a week. I don't know what it looks like exactly because it's a lot of coordination across offices, but I'm absolutely committed to that. But I think also I'm interested in creating community committees, right, on issues so that when legislation comes up, community members get to say whether the legislation works for them. They get to inform what's going on. They get to tell me what's the direction I need to take because I am very clear that I do not have the answers, right? The answers come from us and our lived experience. So our community members, I'm hoping our office will be an organizing space where you can come and figure out together how we're gonna address these massive issues, but also how we create consistent bodies that are going to hold not only the elected representative accountable, me, but also how we're going to make sure that our legislation speaks to what our needs are. Um, and I think we have to do that in language accessible ways. If we don't speak the languages of our community members, they will not understand. If our community members are not going to a particular place, then we need to switch up the game. Our responsibility is to be responsive because we work for the community. And so we need to make sure that we do everything in our power to make sure that we meet community where community is at. So thank you for the question. Our resident council needs an office. We don't have an office in our resident council. Yes. They're meeting in a living room. That is unfair to 3,000 units in Red Hook. We need offices for our resident council. Yes. Yes, that boy is hurt. Uh, make sure I have more people who can hear that voice. So, uh, thank you for that question. I think it's a great question. How do you make sure the voice is not being heard? Now, I think what's even more relevant is that when you, when, her, when the voice is being heard, it doesn't stop here. It's translating into action. And that action will result in something that actually we can see. Something physical, something tangible. We need to have a plan for every idea. And it has to be carried out. This is something that the government lacks. Too much talking and not enough action. It's time that we should take action for everybody. Now, to be honest, politics is not about getting somebody 100% happy. Nobody gets 100% happy. In politics, there's a lot of compromise. But in my opinion, if everybody gets about equally unhappy on a, on a bill, I think that's a good bill. That means everybody got a fair portion of representatives in that legislation. It will get 100%. But if everybody gets 70% of your agenda is met, that would be a pr pretty good um, deal. So that's what I would do. I make sure everybody in District 38 will get a say in every bill. Everybody's interest will be covered as much as possible. I understand that sometimes it's a hard choice, and I will stand for those hard choice. If you have to blame me, you know, I'll take the blame. But I I'm here to fight for you. I think what's really important is that people should come out to vote and know that their voices will be heard. And I'll make sure those voices, not just going to my ear, but also to the ears of the, uh, the related officials. Make sure those departments get heard. Just like the, the lady over there just said about the housing problem. I make sure the housing authority will hear to that voice. That's what I can promise you. Um, so voice will bring it, will go into the right ear. That's what I will do. Thank you. done at the city council level. Number one, I agree with what other people have said. We need an office here in Red Hook and in Sunset Park. We cannot function with only one office. As someone who lives in Red Hook and has lived in here for years, it is too difficult to get to the Sunset Park office. And you can't get there. I mean, that's a whole, we can talk about the infrastructure and the transportation and how difficult it is actually to cross the highway and all that, but we're not going to get into that right now. Um, second, 
is that transparency and accountability are key. And I am your neighbor. I am from this neighborhood. I actually live two blocks down, and I'm not going anywhere. So accountability is here. I will be held accountable. I want you to hold me accountable. You know where to find me. Third, it's about action and response. So our community, like I mentioned before, works extremely hard. Our community is extremely special because we get stuff done. And when there is a problem, we need someone to respond and to listen. Listen to the problem and respond with action. Throughout the pandemic, I have been responding to every single issue here in Red Hook, and I respond right away and you have my number, and we talk, and we get it done. And that is what it's about. And lastly, my, since day one of my, me running for this seat, I have always said that it's a community governance model. And what that means is that taking community leaders, anyone who has a stake in the community, especially organizations, you know, uh, NYCHA leaders, religious leaders, everybody in the community and bringing them to the table and having a direct stake on decision making. So during the pandemic, every Friday, as everybody here in Red Hook knows, we all had calls together. We all had conference calls where we talked about what was going on in different parts of the neighborhood. And that's really what led us to be organized and get stuff done. On City Council, we will have a co-governance model which will, in every single neighborhood, have these community groups that are truly in charge of the decision making and that the power of the office is leveraged to get these things done. Thank you. So, a uh, couple of things on this question. Super important question. Absolutely, I've already committed publicly to uh, figuring out how to bring an office to, to this part of the district. And so it could be, as Rodrigo suggested, in combination with other elected officials, absolutely open to that idea. But I'm also open to working with, with the nonprofit sector and folks who are on the ground. And if we can make that work, that can also be an option. So yes, absolutely committed to doing that. My second part to the answer, though, is back to engagement. Um, you know, I borrow a lot from my professional work. Um, and in my professional work, we really seek to engage families and communities by eliminating barriers. Um, and, and so I really want to continue to borrow from that model. I want to borrow from what we did in Community Board 7. And my third part to this answer is um, we have to build the community's capacity to engage. It's okay, you know, and, and the first step is to commit to it. The first step is to eliminate all the barriers. But the, the most important phase of this is making sure we build communities' capacity to be engaged in conversations, in all conversations, whether it's going up against a developer, whether it's crafting legislation. We need to build the community's capacity. So what do I mean by that? It, it entails a host of things. Uh, if folks need language access, we need to build capacity around language access. If folks need leadership capacity, we need to build leadership capacity. So we have to invest in community. We can't just say we want you to be involved and then not build your capacity to actually engage in a meaningful way. And so for me, any conversation about increasing community engagement needs to be coupled with a conversation about the resources to build their capacity to actually be engaged in these conversations. So I'm looking forward to doing that. I've done that and I will continue to do that. Thank you for the question. Thank you for the question. My plan about having an office here in Red Hook will come to fruition if I was the councilman. We will have an office here, or we will have some satellite that's operational six days a week. Believe me when I tell you. With the engagement of the community hearing their voice, my message to people in, the, in this whole district is this seat, this council seat, do not belong to Vic Swinton. It belongs to the people. 
The people are the ones who can put you in, and they're the ones who can take you out. So my plan is, as was stated before, maybe this is why it's back to the last, um, is to have committees set up on different topics that's dealing with this community. The waterfront, the housing development, jobs, whatever. You guys, the, the, the citizens, the constituents of this district could tell me better what needs to be done in City Hall. So with your voice, your energy, we'll take that message to City Hall and we'll work hard to get it done. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. So we're going to switch up the order really quickly. We're going to have, our, we're going to have another student ask questions, but since we're pressed for time, after our student asks their questions, we're going to open it up to two questions from the audience. They will ask and we'll move on to our other topic so we can end hopefully on time. After which, the audience will have opportunity to speak with the candidates one-on-one -on -one as we break down because we do want to abide by the law of the land here. So I'll invite Dylana up. Dylana. And then we will start from our legal event. So, sorry. so if you do have any questions for the candidates, you can line up right here. We're going to take two questions from the audience right after you got to answer this question. Public safety program at the RHI, and my question to you are: What is your plan for the and what is your plan for affordable housing for the residents here in Redmond? Thank you. That's a really great question. So, displacement housing—that's why I'm running. That's what got me into this fight. Um, you know, in the last 25 years. Black and brown New Yorkers have been pushed out further and further away from the center of the city. That's not an accident. That's not an accident. The Bloomberg rezoning, the rezoning that Mayor Bloomberg put into effect while he was mayor, have been proven, have been shown to have pushed out black and brown New Yorkers from New York City. So we need to recognize that that's a fact, and we need to recognize that that kind of rezoning that's, that's driven by private interest, that's driven by speculators that are trying to raise the property value to make money, is not the kind of planning that is going to benefit New Yorkers. So, I put out a very detailed plan on how we're going to turn the tables on that. We're going to have a comprehensive citywide plan that's founded in racial, economic, and environmental justice, that's community-led, and that follows visions already created by our communities. So we need the communities to lead, to let the city know what we want. We need the Department of City Planning to be cleaned up because this is a body that's mayorally appointed, that's full of private developers, that's full of people that worked in government and now work for the real estate industry. So we need to change that. And it's going to take time. It's not going to be from one moment to the next. That's the long-term plan. In the short-term plan, we need to work with our partners in the state to make sure we have good cause eviction. So you can't get kicked out just because you can't pay rent. You can't get kicked out of your house because you've been unemployed for a year because it's been a pandemic. So I want to extend the eviction moratorium. I want to work with our state partners to pass good cause eviction. We need to ensure that small landlords and tenants are made whole during this pandemic so that they're not pushed out because they can't pay rent because the entire world went into a standstill. So those are some of the things that I want to do. But we got to recognize that the way that we build housing, the way we plan, isn't working for New Yorkers, and we have to change that. So in terms of affordable housing, what's going to be really important for all of us is not only who is elected as your representative of city council, but who the mayor is. So the mayor is so important because we know Housing policy and funding is driven but at the state level and the mayor, right? So the city council is going to fight and the eyes of representatives will fight for real affordability. And when I say that, not you got to make $125,000 a year for a $4,000 apartment. For real affordability, we have the data, we know what it is. We have the highest 
homelessness rate and housing insecurity. We have probably upwards of 50,000 people who are on the brink of eviction right now, waiting for when the courts open and when the moratorium expires. So we need the city to truly invest its resources in funding affordable housing. Low income housing, low income. Low income, thank you. Yes, low absolutely low income. Thank you for that correction because it is true, people. It, it's too vague of a term. We're absolutely low income housing. So as your city council representative, I am committed to ensuring that we battle the land use battle so that we stop giving our public land to developers for free, that we allow them to develop simply market rate luxury housing all along our waterfront and anywhere where there's public assets that should be used for the people that work here, right? And when I say here, I mean all of New York City. Much of my family left because they can't afford it. So, um, so land use, funding, alignment with the state, and I just beg you to truly look at the mayoral candidates because this is a critical issue and the mayor will be really important on making sure that we get low income housing or not. So thank you for the question. The housing problem follows a very simple economic principle of supply and demand. When there's too much in demand and not enough supply, that drives the price up. Now, everybody comes to New York City for different purposes to buy a house. Some people buy a house because they need a place to live, while some others buy a house because they just want to invest and not live here. They get about 5 to 10% of increase in the property value. And those demands shouldn't be competing with our needs and demands to have a house. Now, if I was elected, I would introduce a legislation to differentiate the needs of our housing between people who actually live here versus people who are investing in housing. They should not be competing with each other. People who live here are struggling to buy a house that have higher priority to buy a house than those who are investing. If they have more money to invest, they can invest in stock. They don't have to be competing with a house. That way, that's very deep. And I'll also make it easier for developers to create to, to create a supply pool of housing without reducing the, the quality and also effectively decreasing uh, the home price. Now we know in the past 20 years, housing price go up about three times, while the uh, wage and salary are about the same. It did not go up three times. But 20 years ago, we were able to buy a house with the salary we made. So that's the problem we're facing today. The housing is going up too much, while the, the, our income is not going up proportionally. So that should be controlled in a, in, a, uh, in a scientific and a mathematical manner. If housing is going up in that proportion, increase in 5 to 10% a year, then we should see an income increase in that in the same manner. If not, then there's something wrong with, with the housing price. We need to have bring better jobs, make better jobs for this community. And what I mean that is that when we develop those houses, um, let's say they paid about 50% for for labor and raw materials, that should be about the price that we should be paying for the house if we were to buy a house. Not the add-on value, not the you know the overpay for the regula regulatory and tickets that we're paying to the government, to the real estate developers. Now real estate developers, they should get their fair, fair, uh, fair share of the amount of profit, which is about 15 to 20 percent. Just like you do any business, if you're selling a donut, if you're selling newspapers, you get about 15 to 20 percent. That should be capped with your profit margin. That should be the money that we should pay for the house. You know, the raw material, uh, the labor, and some modern profit for the developer, and that's it. That will be affordable. If we if we work as hard laborers, then we should be able to afford a house. That's the, the normal society that we should live in. That's the whole picture that we should face. Housing problem is not just a problem in the housing. It's a problem, it's a systematic problem. There needs to be a fix in our income in proportion to the real estate price. That's what I believe in. Thank you. Gentrification. Here, I'm gonna pull this down. I think everybody pull it down. So let's talk about gentrification. Red Hook is one of the most 
gentrified neighborhood slowly becoming that I've ever seen. And we have to stop it now. Because after Hurricane Sandy, a lot of developers came in and priced us all out. So my family used to live down on Conover Street, right by the water. It was a really beautiful area to live. It provided me an awesome childhood growing up there on the water. Now, nine years ago when Hurricane Sandy came through, it devastated us. And it made it really hard to live for all of us for years. As you can see, we're still not recovered. And my family had to move out of our house. And when my mother, just a couple years later, when she tried to come back to her home, she could not afford any anything, any apartment. Because everything was already turning into gentrification, into luxury development on Van Brent Street. All of these houses 15 years ago were not there. We're not there, period. And no one stood up for Red Hook. No one protected Red Hook. Now on city council, there are things that you can do. Number one, we have to make sure that we prioritize affordable housing. And this is possible by changing the Euler process and making sure that every single new development that comes into our neighborhood has a racial impact study, has an environmental impact study, and we can build 100% affordable housing in every type of building. And this is done by this council creating a universal, afford universal affordable housing, universal rent control, and universal rent caps as well as borrowing from the capital budget because New York City is one of the most wealthiest cities in the entire world and people don't talk about that, we have the money. And then number two, I'm sorry, but you can't talk about affordable housing without mentioning that we have the largest affordable housing development in Brooklyn. And without someone fighting to fully fund NYCHA, without someone fighting for fixing the just unacceptable and inhumane conditions that we're all faced with in this neighborhood, we're not going to get anything done. And this is a task that's hard, right? We all hear that, that's the excuse. Oh, it's a beast to do affordable housing. NYCHA is a beast. That's not an excuse and that's not gonna fly anymore. Because I am a strong fighter who will get it done. And I will stop until yeah. we get it done, no matter Thank you. Thank you. Jackie, 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 Yes, yes to fully funding NYCHA first and foremost. Other low hanging fruit is uh, rent relief, mortgage relief, all of those are short term. In the long term, and this is again very, very personal to me, uh, housing is. Uh, because when my parents came from, from Mexico, the only way that we could afford to live is by doubling up and tripling up in, in a very small apartment and that that was seared into my consciousness about how in the richest city the richest country in the world that we can't give folks immigrant folks working class folks people of color dignity in their living conditions and we can and we must do better around our housing situation i don't buy the excuse that we don't have the resources to do that we don't have the right priorities and when i get to the city council that's going to be my number one priority for this district is the affordability crisis and i agree with what's been said before structural reform needs to happen the euler process the as of right where developers are coming in and, and like really evading a lot of the community through this as of right context. We need to change that. And we need to invest, okay? We need to make sure that we are utilizing resources that exist, and if we determine that the existing resources aren't enough, we need to raise additional revenue. And it's a good start that we're gonna start taxing the wealthiest New Yorkers. The marijuana tax is also a great start. 
But we have to find other revenue streams to make sure that we have the funding to fund what matters in this city. And housing is the number one priority, period. Let's not kid ourselves. Developers, when they build, they're building to make money. We want nothing to do with low-income housing, affordable housing, anything of that nature. The gentrification that's happening around here, listening to some people in those developments, they're afraid that those developments are next. So rather, roll up your sleeves and get ready to fight. Yeah, yeah. Roll up your sleeves and get ready to fight. Rebel ain't going nowhere. That ain't gonna happen. Someone mentioned it's not gonna happen. The city don't try to scare me. Building on property to make everything affordable. And that's great. That's the only way I think it will happen. As I stated before, developers are not in it to make you happy. They're in it to make money. And hopefully the city wakes up because they have failed. They have fed. Hopefully they wake up and they'll build these affordable housing for people in communities, especially those of color, and give them a sound and good place to live. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Are you guys still with us? Yeah! All right. So now we have two questions from, from members of the community. All right. And can I see, let's be mindful of the time. We may have to cut a little bit short and then open it up to just personal interaction with the, with the audience as well after that. Thank you, thank you. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank the jury for putting this together. Um, and that's, that gives me hope the that they put this together. If you put this simply gave me process together. All right. Um, I'm accountable to the health community. Um, and I want to ask y'all a question because y'all talk about, about developing, y'all talk about uh, change in but we have real time things that's going on right now. And when you know with FEMA at get money for the developing with the um make the so with the flooding, they make it so they're gonna raise the first floors of the projects, all right. So they come in, the developers come out here and I got the name of the company right here. It. I'm going to talk into the mic a little bit more so y'all can hear me. Make sure while I get this picture so y'all can know the developers that's out here. I think it's European contractors. But they're out here and they're not even following the oh, Adam, Adam's European Contracting Incorporation. That's what they're okay. And they're not even following the section three dollars. So you said it. Developers don't care. They don't need to make money. But here is it, but FEMA, the government gives money to, and they're exploiting the community, but they're not even allowing the task force, the work task force to be from the community. So that's, and when the, and it's only two, it's only two people from the community actually on the task force right now. Half a billion dollars. This is two people. Half a billion right? and dollars. They're flaggers. So when the, the, the contractors leave, they're leaving the flaggers here in this community. So what I want to know from you, candidates, what can y'all do within the next week to address the situation? Because we don't need promises. We need real-time action. Because this is happening in real time. That's the question I want to know from y'all. Because there's an issue of real time, and it's, it hits right on systemic racism, and y'all talk about that, so I want to hear what y'all want to do within the coming week to make sure that more the task forces, not just flaggers, but actually getting trained in, 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 in professional jobs so they can feed families out here. My plan this week, hearing what you just told me, is I'm going to get in contact with the elected officials because they are they are the ones who really should be pushing this stuff. That they don't they only have two people working on it. I heard this from a lot of people in the community, and, and it's actually a shame. It is a shame. Um, we 
but we also have to ensure, and this is one of my plans, and this is this is not coming within a week. We have to get these young folks trained and doing some of these jobs. Um, because they are rightfully to get some of these jobs out there. They are trained. They're trained. They're trained. They've been training since 2015. OSHA 30. OSHA 40. OSHA 10. That's, that's not what I'm hearing, but since you say I, 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 I agree, I, I understand. Well, then they should be getting the job. One thing I'm hearing about the job is these deeds and these leases and stuff about people on leases. And, and it's scary, and it's scary people away from signing up for these jobs. We have to cut through that red tape. That shouldn't matter. Absolutely. That shouldn't matter. A job is a job no matter where you live. If someone, and I'm hearing some people are coming from upstate down here to work. If they could come from upstate to Red Hook to work, then you could give somebody a job that could walk right outside that building and, and do the job. So that least thing, it has to be checked when it's thrown out the window. Because I hear there's jobs coming out here, but they want to make sure your name's on the lease. I think that's great. That's and, and, it, and it needs to be changed. It needs to be changed. So let's start with um, what we can do today. And, and today, I can, what I want to do is get more information from you. So let's let's get through this. Let's have a conversation and let's give me some more information. That's number one. Number two, uh, what I can do is leverage the relationship that I have with the elected officials that I know represent this district and and get us in a room and get us on a zoom and get us on a call and get us talking about what you want what you need um but first i need more information thank you so thank you for the question this is something that you and i spoke about last weekend and i'm going to let you know that i actually looked up the law because after our conversation last weekend i looked up the law and it's a suggested 30 percent Hiring. So we need to make sure that this is the minimum, first of all, that they hire minimum 30% from the neighborhood, especially during COVID, because that's also the safest thing for them to have their workers live close by. And second, I looked up the company, the guy's name is Frank, because you know I don't have any problem putting anybody on blast, that's his name. Um, and I called him. He didn't pick up, left him a voicemail, but we'll see if he calls me back. And I'm looking forward to meeting with you, meeting with anybody on Monday morning, and going over there in person, because he didn't answer my call. And the thing is that I understand that people are saying this is an elected official issue. That is true. That is supposed to be true. But right now, we're not getting any help from the elected official offices. I have emails the offices of our elected officials asking about the construction, asking about the closed bathrooms in the park. I don't get any response. And especially as a community member, I, this is, you, you represent me. You need to be responding to me. And this is a, a bigger issue that we're having here. Not only are they not following the rules, but the government's not following the rules either. So, we can come together and look forward to working on this issue. We get a lot done with people power here at Red Hook. So we're going to get it done. And uh, Monday morning, 10 a.m., see you there. Jackie! 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 I think it was also important that all of our colleagues take about here or reach out to them in the next week. Because if all six of us reach out to them, it means the next councilman is definitely on this topic. And we need to tell them they need to hire more of the local people. Local residents here from Red Hook. And they need to be hired. If they cannot hire them, they need to train them. And those who work there should be able to work in the hope that they will be able to purchase the house in the future. If they they, you know, they uh, invested their time, invested their labor, they should invest in a hope 
that one day they can buy those houses. They can live in there. That's only that's just fair. We're not asking for much. People work, then people may be able to fulfill the dreams here. That's the message. And then they all take two months to reach out to them. That carries a strong message. If all of us reach out, that means the next council member is definitely behind Redford's back. Thank you. So yeah, the, the controller is um, an office that audits city agencies. The controller has audited these contracts and have found in the sample that 90% of the contracts that have been granted that are supposed to do the suggested 30% failed in every circumstance. This is not a new issue. It is more egregious and awful every single time. And the fact that there are only two people working in a half a billion dollar project is a crime. When we were here for the march, I was talking to our current congressional representative, Miriam Velasquez, about why there's only two. And at the time, I only knew of one. Community residents had said, we only know of one person. So I'm glad to hear there's somebody else, but that is criminal. So we need to change the law because there is no enforcement for this issue. It's on the books, but if you can't enforce, contractors will continue to evade. So I will say we need to change the law to make sure there's real enforcement, real financial clawback. You don't hire, there are training programs. Thousands of people in NYCHA developments across New York City have had all the training and no one is getting jobs. So we need to change the law to make sure that there's real enforcement, to make sure that we hold people accountable. We know the bathrooms are not operational because the contractors cut the electricity to the bathroom. Why aren't they paying for a porta potty or getting that fixed ASAP? Nobody's being held accountable. So it's going to require all of us. It's going to require this office. It's going to require coordination. And yes, we need to do this together. And you, you know, it's got to be like no mass, no more. There's so many things that we are fighting right now. We're fighting to survive, we're fighting for families, and I know we're tired. But we're gonna have to hold the federal, uh, federal government accountable, every elected official, and make them tired of us. You know how the young people sit in offices and they block stuff, civil disobedience? We won't have to consider some of that because the condition is terrible. And I'm here to fight with you. You know, it's, um, it's unbelievable that a half a billion dollar contract, and yet they cause water outages, they cause gas outages, and who still has to pay full rent? NYCHA residents still have to pay full rent. It's a, sh it's a damn shame, it's a crime, that these millionaire contractors are still making money, aren't being held accountable, aren't being held to pay for causing harm and ha causing damage, and not only that, for failing to meet their responsibility to hire locally. And that happens time and time again. So yes, we need to work with our controller, we need to work with the city council to hold people accountable, but our congresswoman could do more. Look, I love Nidia, she's a great person, but she could do more to hold this federal contractor accountable. We need to hold our federal contractors accountable, and we need our federal representative to do that. So our congresswoman needs to do that. And then when it comes to NYCHA overall, you know, NYCHA is the only landlord that isn't held accountable by city agencies. Over a thousand violations reported to HPD. Over a thousand violations that the Red Hook Community Justice Center has chronicled. What's happening? When's NYCHA going to fix things? When's NYCHA going to be held accountable? Right? So we need to make NYCHA we need to make HPD hold NYCHA accountable. We also make, need to make sure that NYCHA has the resources to fully fix and repair all the damage that's been long standing. And you know how much it costs? It costs $780 million. Okay? That's. And we can pay for that. You know how we can pay for that? We can pay for that by defunding the NYPD. Okay? Just by $1 billion. Okay? But we can go more. We can pay for that by not opening five borough-based jails, which is each going to cost a billion dollars. 
We can do that. We can do that by prioritizing it, by having leadership that's not going to settle for crumbs, that's not going to settle for the middle ground, that's not going to settle for the status quo, because the status quo kills. The status quo changes and impacts people. And we're not putting up with that anymore. And that's what I'm about. All right? Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is now 4.06. We went six minutes over, but I figured that you guys are a little bit tired. So, ladies and gentlemen, please a round of applause for all of our candidates. Thank you guys very much. We have um, information on race choice voting um, and also for the primary as well. We're going to end this right here and give you guys an opportunity to mingle with the uh, community here as we break down. So once again, thank you to all of the candidates. Thank you to all of our youth leaders. And make sure that you go out and vote, vote, and make your voice heard for the primary election. Thank you, thank you, thank you again. young people who do this event for every last of the year. We're going to be taking every aspect, every aspect of this event. From sound our parents to set up, they were the ones who were putting this stage together, so thank them. They have a great team for them. Yeah. Uh, speaking of this time, all our guys, staff and um, young adults, can you have us come here real quick? Please, all our guys, staff and young adults. Everyone else, thank y'all for coming. Y'all are great mothers yeah, yeah, to <laughs> And feel free, and feel free to um, everyone that's in the audience, mingle with the candidates. If you have any questions that you want them to ask, to answer, I'm sure that they can. All our five staff, please come up to the podium. Yeah, Candace, can we get a photo with you and the young people? Candace, can we get a photo with you and the young people on stage? If you're a candidate, can you come on stage? We would love to get a photo with you and the other Alright, I'm sorry. And I'm sorry.